Well, I don't think I could do a better introduction than that for Donna. Uh, but it is my pleasure to introduce to everyone Donna Dubinsky, uh, who without her support for Yale Tech, none of these conferences would be possible. Uh, she's been an amazing facilitator bringing together the Yale Tech community. Uh, but in her actual day job, uh, she is currently the CEO and co-founder of Numenta, which she'll spend some time talking about today. Um, but she previously founded Handspring and served as CEO of Palm. Uh, she earned her BA from Yale University and her MBA from Harvard Business School and currently sits on the board of Yale University. So I'll hand it over back to Donna. Okay, thank you, Victor. Let me start by saying I'm battling a cold and usually you can hear me in the next county, but I'm struggling a little with my voice, so I'll do the best I can. Um, but forgive me if I need to sip water and so on um, as I try to get through that. So when I, I chatted with Victor about what to talk about today, I decided I would uh, tackle a topic I haven't done before, so I'm trialing this out on you guys. You can let me know later if it works or not. But I've been thinking a bit about my career being this career on the edge of technology and, and what does that mean and what have been the good parts and the bad parts about picking a career along those dimensions. So that's what I was going to talk about. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you my credentials in this regard. I asked Victor to not go into the details so that I could. And um, first, I, I went to Apple very early on, 1981. And at the time, uh, the notion of one computer, one person was absolutely extraordinary. It was inconceivable. At that time, computers were uh, in raised floor, locked computer rooms, accessible only to computer experts and not normal people. And that's just not what computers were. And it's so hard to put yourself back in that mindset uh, from, from that time, but it was a, a very radical notion. As a result, um, there, there was nothing there for it. There were no suppliers for the components to build these computers. There were no dealers. Uh, my first job was in distribution, and we pretty much created this retail distribution network. There was, there was nothing like that that existed before. There were no people that had experience. It was, you know, if you hired people, you hired people who had never worked in the computer industry before. There was no software. There was no application. So really, it was a, a, a situation where you were definitely out out there on the edge. Then the second time I did this was I went from there to Palm. And Palm was in roughly the same situation. The idea of a computer in your pocket, again, totally radical, couldn't imagine that anybody was going to be able to do this. It was inconceivable. There weren't components to build the Palm Pilot. I'll tell you one quick story. We wanted a display, obviously, for the Palm Pilot. Those of you who remember it, it was a monochrome display before they made color displays that small. And we had a huge problem finding somebody to build us this display. Because we went to the regular display manufacturers and like, no, that's a small black and white display. We're building big color displays. We're not interested. And um, we, we really struggled with this till finally we hit upon the idea of going to the guys who were making the displays for pagers. Remember the little pagers? They were small monochrome displays. And they went, wow, a big monochrome display. That's a, that's a big opportunity for us to move upstream. So we'll do that. Uh, and we got them in the business of doing those displays. Same thing with memory, same things with other components. There just simply weren't components for that product. There wasn't any, it wasn't clear what the distribution strategy would be. Should we go through consumer electronics players? Should we go through those computer dealers? The computer dealers weren't interested in these little tiny things because they were lower cost. The, um, the consumer electronics guys were like, oh, this is a computer. We're scared of that. We don't want to do that. So they really, it was hard to find what was the right distribution channel for this. There was no software, no apps, same thing. And again, no experts to hire. You couldn't go out and find the world's expert in marketing handheld computers when nobody had ever built a handheld computer before. Then the third time I did it was at Handspring. And in that case, we said, we're going to connect these things to the world. We're going to make them smartphones. And we started out with a kind of a slot where we plug phones into them. And we said, that's what we're going to do. Well, same set of issues there. Back again on components, I mean, the radios. To buy a radio to put into uh, the early 
handspring and trio products was extremely difficult. I mean, people hardly made these things. We found one company in France that was making these radios for people to embed in products, and that was it. I mean, we scoured the world, and these radios had lots and lots of quality problems in the beginning. So it was very difficult to get the components to build this stuff. The data networks were totally immature. I mean, we have these you know, incredible data networks today. This is before Wi-Fi. This is before you could actually do data over the cellular, net cellular network. So we were dealing with kind of stealing little data channels from the voice networks, and it was extremely difficult to be able to use this stuff on the data networks at the time. Um, there was the, the distribution was a huge problem. There's um, carrier stranglehold. You had to go through the carriers, which was extremely difficult and challenging to work with those guys. They were basically public utilities uh, trying to morph into uh, businesses, and uh, they were, I could tell you lots of stories about that, extremely difficult to work with, um, so very hard to establish distribution, and once again, there were no experts to hire, I mean, if you, you know, we found one guy who had experience with GSM radio, it's like, oh my gosh, I remember, you know, paying this guy like a fortune, because, you know, to find a guy who actually had experience with this sort of stuff was just amazing, so uh, very, very challenging, and then now I'm doing Numenta, and I feel like I'm kind of back in the same thing. We're working on intelligent computing. Uh, these are computers that learn the same way you learn and your brain learns. It's based on um, biology, so we need people who understand biology and neuroscience as well as computer science, and you know it's hard to find those people. And um, it's not clear what the applications are. We're trying out a bunch of applications. We've proven out some things. It's very interesting. It's very important, but it's still early, and it's hard to imagine what these applications are going to be as that rolls out. Uh, so very difficult time. Oh, one of the other big challenges with Numenta is that the way your brain operates and the way our technology operates is on streaming data, so data flowing through time. If you think about sensors and the data they put out as opposed to databases or Hadoop or things like that, and most companies say they have this kind of data, but when you actually get into the detail, you find they don't really have this kind of data. So there's going to be a conversion from these spatially oriented database approach to data in motion, temporal streaming data. And we're just starting that conversion. Reminds me very much of dealing with the carriers and the problems of getting data over the cellular networks. So these are, are very comparable problems that I've seen you know, time and time again after uh, very many years in this, in this industry. So, so how do I sort of characterize some of these challenges? Well, first, uh, there's just no roadmap. It's not like you can look and say, what have others done, and I'm going to just do it a little better. I'm going to do what those guys did, but faster, but smarter, but more creatively, better branding, whatever. I mean, it's kind of the way people call the Uber of X now. I'm going to do the Uber of whatever, where you have a clear model, and you just follow that model, tweak it a little, and off you go. You don't have that. These are all discovery uh, kind of opportunities. You have no suppliers. I, people forget about this. They focus so much on customers that they forget about how hard it can be to find um, suppliers who can provide you with the materials you need to uh, create the product you're trying to create. Likewise, there's no infrastructure. So every single time we had distribution challenges, we had communications challenges, it was hard to talk to your audience. It just every single time we were dealing with um, massive infrastructure problems. And you need to be flexible. You know you're going to make errors. You just don't know which ones you're going to make. And so what you try to do is figure out, all right, I'm going to take a shot at this thing. But if I'm wrong, I want to make sure I limit the damage and I can change when I figure out I'm wrong. So you start to view things very much from the lens of flexibility as opposed to absolute what's the right answer and what's the wrong answer because you know you're going to have to um, make some errors along the way. Very hard to hire. Uh, you end up looking to basic strengths, intellect, skills, not expertise. I just really could have cared less in pretty much all these companies whether somebody had the specific expertise I was looking for. I was really looking for talent. And you can find analogies. I remember in our, our early sales force at um, Apple, many of the early sales reps were from the old electronic distributions network. They'd sold electronics things, they'd sold them into distributors, but they had no experience with computers, and they had no experience with consumer products, but we could train them on that. They knew they had selling skills, they knew they could learn about electronics, and so you find an analogy and you hire from there as opposed to looking for people with exactly those skills. So those are the challenges. What about the rewards? 
why bother? Why do this? Isn't it much easier to just figure out something you do, just tweak and get it out there? Well, first I have to start with the fact that the financial rewards are much greater. So biggest risk, biggest rewards. Classic risk-reward curve, upper right, biggest risk, biggest reward. So that's no doubt. If you want to get wealthy, that's the way to do it. However, you may get zero. So you have to be prepared for the fact that, um, that that's, that's the gamble there. So bigger risk, bigger reward. But there are an awful lot of um, incredible rewards outside of the financial rewards. And, and I think it's really important to understand those. First, it's incredibly creative. I mean, you get to solve really hard problems. And there's just no answer sheet for them. So you have to figure them out. I remember we had this problem once with the trio where it was failing. It just was failing over and over again, a quality problem. And we just couldn't figure it out. And we, you know, looked at this problem. We looked at this problem. We looked at this problem. We just couldn't figure it out. Finally, I said, this is it. We're getting everybody in the room. I got the hardware guy, the software guy, the manufacturing guy, the, somebody from every single function, the best I had in the company. I said, I locked the door. We are not leaving this room until we figure out what this problem is. And it turned out that literally we had put um, on the, the back of the case with the, the door for the batteries, we put a sticker on the battery door, and, and it, it created enough friction that it disconnected the batteries from the connectors when it went in, which lost a software patch that had fixed an earlier problem such that then the, the computer failed. It was just amazing. And, but it took actually somebody with knowledge of manufacturing, with knowledge of hardware, and with knowledge of software to figure out those things working together is what created that problem. Um, but you know, solving those kind of problems was just um, really a lot of fun, you know, just giant puzzles if, if you can solve them. Um, and then I would say that um, the people are very fun. Risk, tech, risk takers tend to be very fun, very lively, very interesting people. Sometimes a little crazy. You have to get used to dealing with sometimes a little crazy people. But uh, I, for one, have a, uh, a, a very broad acceptance of a lot of different types of people, and you find them in these types of endeavors, and that's, that's been very satisfying for me. And I think that just the notion of how hard it is to make it work, then when you succeed, it's that much more satisfying. So it's when things are easy, you can be a big success and pat yourself on the back. I remember when Handspring was really going great. I thought I was, you know, the most brilliant CEO in the world. Then, you know, when we ran into problems and I had to get us out of them, um, I suddenly had a new realization, which was that this is actually when the really great CEOs prove themselves, is getting out of the hard problems, as opposed to the ones that just ride the wave when times are good. So I think that the notion of accepting bigger challenge and getting bigger satisfaction is something that's always appealed to me. But the biggest one by far in my book is just impact, is that knowing what you're working on can really impact people's lives in a positive way. I mean, everything I've worked on has, over these four different um, waves of computing, has helped make computing tools more and more accessible to more and more people to solve more and more problems. And to me, I still get a thrill every time I see somebody with a smartphone, which is every now and then, uh, and know that I was part of the foundational group that made that happen. And um, that's just been a, an incredible thing to be a part of for a career, so very worthwhile. So what are those things today? Well, I'm sure you guys all have ideas about what those things are today, and I'm sure that you're right about some of them. I find it amusing when I hear people say, oh, the future is mobile, the future is mobile. I say, no, no, no. Uh, the, the thing was to figure out that the future was mobile 20 years ago before it was obvious. You know, we were working on mobile then, and nobody thought the future was mobile. Everybody thought we were totally crazy. So the idea that now you're saying the future is mobile and you think that's a big new thing, well, that is not it. That that was it, but that is not it now. The question is, what is it over the next 10 years or the next 20 years that's not obvious today that's the way to get involved in that leading edge? So clearly, I think one of these things is intelligent computing. We've seen a lot of activity on this in just the last year or two. We've been working on it for over 10 years. Um, everything in this field takes a long time. Uh, I think we're making uh, stunning progress, so I'm very excited. And I think that there's going to be 
whole new businesses built on top of this. Lots and lots of opportunities of things that one can do with this technology that simply can't be done today. So I'm very excited about that because that's clearly what I'm in the middle of. But I think there's others as well. I'm very excited about 3D printing. I think 3D printing is going to create all sorts of new opportunities of building things on demand and creating things you never could have created before. I think drones are very interesting. I can imagine all sorts of new businesses that come out of the idea that you can take a different look at the world and you can take a look at the world now. I think the whole biomedical area is absolutely fascinating. I know it's a tough area. I'm no expert in it. I know regulatory is, is very challenging, but I think that... Um, data science and genetics and personalized medicine and all these areas are going to create enormous opportunities in that field as well. So for the people who say, oh, it's all over or it's all we're going to do is build yet another way to order food on a mobile app, uh, I just want to uh, encourage you. We have a lot of ways. I think having people in their 20s all creating companies is a really wonderful thing, but we don't need more ways to get food, get dates, and get rides. We are well served. <laughs> We are really well served. So um, I, I urge you to think about these other areas that are not so obvious, that are harder, and that are higher risk and potentially higher reward. So those were my comments, and I tried to leave time for questions, which I think I did. So I'm happy to take any questions for you. Can you talk about some of the lessons that you learned from working at Palm and Handspring and how that's currently like affecting how you run Numenta? Lessons that I've learned, well, I have whole talks on this that take multiple hours, um, so I've been thinking I should write a book on this, but haven't gotten around to it. Well, one is uh, absolutely to defy conventional wisdom. Um, I have spent all of my career defying conventional wisdom. Whenever anybody says, you can't do this because of something or other, or you have to do it this way, it just goes in one ear and out the other. I don't even listen to it anymore, and it's, it's so common. So, so common. I'll tell you an Apple story, actually, that was one of my favorites. Early in the Apple days, when we were, I was running distribution, we put in this thing, a policy called price protection, because dealers would have all this inventory, and the price of a product would go down, and they'd have this inventory, so we would protect their inventory, give them the amount of it. So I established this, I researched it, I put it in place, so on. Well, then several years later, I decided to change it for some reason. Something happened differently, and you know, somebody said to me, but we've always had price protection. It's always been this way. This is the way we have to do it. I'm like, no, no, no. Wait, I made that policy. Here's why I did it. Here's what's changed. And here's why we need to change the policy. I mean, I just, I was just so amazed how people get in these mindsets that we have to do it this way because it's always been done this way. So uh, that is, is probably one of the biggest themes of, of what all those things tie together. And I mean, I could give you a lot more, but let me just stop with one. Other things, yes, over there? Could you repeat that one more time? Sure. She wasn't um, very complimentary about Hadoop, understandably. So I'm wondering for streaming data and data in motion, what technologies you're using and if any of them are open source. And also in terms of your great leaps forward in um, intelligent computing, if you could narrow it down to, say, the last 12 months, can you talk about what opened the door to a great loop forward? Was it technology? Was it a shift in understanding? What was it? Mm -hmm. Well, I did not mean to be disparaging of Hadoop at all. I think um, what I was trying to do is differentiate what we do from the world of big data that, as we know it today, the world of big data as we know it today is very focused on big databases. And that's what the Hadoop world is and many other technologies. Uh, we are focused on streaming data, which is very different than that. So it was more to distinguish the one from the other. In terms of the leap forward, um, my partner, Jeff, who's really the, the product person, um, not me, he is really, the only way that you can phrase it, he is reverse engineering the neocortex. He is really trying to understand what the different layers do, what the neurons do, what the uh, actual, all the little bits and pieces in there do. It's extraordinary. And um, where we first started was understanding what one layer in the brain does, and we've got one layer of the six layers where we really have modeled that and understand that, which has to do with s streaming data and making a model of the world. Now, the next part of the theory that he's working on, which is uh, some major breakthroughs in just in the past 12 months, 
has to do with the integration of behavior with that streaming data. So a lot of the way you learn, your brain learns, and our software learns is by motion. So the other object is moving in the world. You see a dog running, and, and that helps you learn about that dog and to recognize that dog. You learn from movies, not from stills. Um, but also you move. So your hands move on things, and, and, and that's how you recognize an object. Your eyes are always moving. It's called a saccade. Uh, you are always moving in the world, and objects are always moving in the world. And the intersection of those and how that impacts the streaming data is how you form a model of the world, and you can understand the world. That's what um, the theory of intelligence is about. So he is now incorporating these multiple motion sets and mapping them against the actual neocortex. So it's pretty stunning. Um, we'll, we'll see what the applications of that are. I'm not entirely sure yet, but what is his name again? Jeff Hawkins. And this is, uh, we are, when you asked about open source, let me just say that at Numenta, we actually have all of our technology in open source. So you can go on numenta.org if you're a, a technically inclined person and see um, everything that we're working on. Um, we also publish papers. We've just had a new paper published that's extremely biological for those of you who are biologically inclined that I think is, is going to come to be a, a huge paper in the field, very important paper in the field. So I urge you to look at that. Okay, so it is a little unusual to be standing in front of you having had a whole career in tech with a history major from Yale, so uh, definitely unusual. Uh, I, I got fortunate in that I got into the industry early, so I, there weren't, you didn't find experts, as I said um, in my opening remarks, so you know, they, they had to hire people who weren't necessarily experts. Um, I went out of my way to understand this stuff as best as I could within my limits. I'll give you an example. I started at Apple in the uh, logistics area, and I signed up for the service tech course. I wasn't going to be a service tech, you know, but I said, that's how I'm going to understand what's in this thing. And we took about compu computers. We learned how to do it. I did disk drive calibrations. I did all this sort of stuff, went through the whole service tech course just because I wanted to understand as much as I could about what the heck was in this thing. Uh, when I joined up with um, Jeff at Palm, he had one patent. And I said, all right, that seems to be a core asset for our new company, so I'm going to understand that patent. So I read that patent. Well, those of you who aren't used to reading patents, you know, reading a patent is really hard to understand what it is saying. So what I did is I sat down with Jeff and I said, okay, I've read this patent. Here's what I think it says. Tell me if I'm right. He'd say, yeah, you're mostly right, but you're a little bit wrong. And here's where you're wrong, and this is what it means. And I just kept, I just kept repeating, repeating, repeating until I understood it in my words, in my framework. And I continue to do that to this day. I mean, the work we're doing, I understand only so far. I understand it more than any other non-technical person. Believe me, I could tell you more about the brain than you can imagine. Uh, but I do not understand it to the degree that the technical people do. But I understand it to the degree that I need to understand it. So uh, I think that's possible for anybody. But it takes work and diligence and, and learning and, and uh, definitely effort. Um, in terms of your second question, what's the right time to leave? Well, I, I'm not sure I can generalize. I mean, for me, each circumstance was, uh, was one very different than the other. When I graduated and went to um, Apple, um, I had seen a demo of an Apple II at business school, and I'd seen it running VisiCalc, and I like, to, I mean, the light bulb went off. I just said, that is amazing. That was the first spreadsheet. I'd done spreadsheets by hand as a banker, and I was like, I just got to go work for that company because that is important. That is important. And so I figured that out, and I harassed them until they gave me a job. Um, it, that was, I mean, it wasn't a startup, but it wasn't a very big company. So it was a pretty early stage company at the time, Apple was. Um, 
I went from Apple, and at Apple, then we created Claris, and then um, after Claris, Apple bought us back, and I left because I wanted to be in a smaller entrepreneurial company, so I didn't want to go back to Apple. I took a year off. I went to Paris, Claris to Paris, made sense, and um, <laughs> learned French. And um, then I, I went through a very deliberate process where I said, I want to be a CEO. I want to be at a startup company. What do I know? I literally did a balance sheet. What are my assets? What are my liabilities? What do I know? What don't I know? What do I need to figure out? I was very, I'm very analytical sometimes. I should have been an engineer. And, um, and I, I realized that I had pretty much all the functions covered except for I wasn't a technologist. I wasn't an engineer. I didn't know really how to do that stuff. So I came back specifically looking for a partner that was those things who I could partner with where I could bring the rest of the things and start a company. And that's when I met Jeff. And then um, the whole Palm story I won't go into. It's too tedious and too, uh, too, what a roller coaster. Anyway, we ended up leaving Palm because of various uh, corporate machinations and starting the new company, Handspring. And uh, eventually Handspring was acquired. So each one was kind of a different story. So uh, I'm not sure I can generalize more. I think Allison said it well. And, you know, you kind of know it when you get there. And when it's time to go, you you know, you need to go, you know, you, uh, staying longer usually doesn't help. So I think she said it well. I think we have time for another question from Melinda. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. I just wanted to ask you how you're going to factor in social behavior, because I, I work in healthcare and teach communication, and we know that 70, over 70% of the safety and quality problems in healthcare, that customers are really motivated to solve are caused by communication errors. So it's social behavior, but it's not really about moving in space. It's about relationships with each other and, and communication. Well, that's kind of a, a complex question. I mean, we're not, we're not trying to create a human brain. We're trying to create kind of a, an analytical engine that's a learning machine, learns from its sensory data that's modeled after your neocortex. Your old brain has a lot of your social activities. We're not doing that. That being said, I've had an, a reasonable amount of encounters with the healthcare system myself lately, and, um, and I, there's so much that can be improved upon that our analytics could help. For example, I, was, I just was in the hospital last weekend with my elderly father, and you know those, like, all those machines they hook them up to, and how they're like, alarms are going off all the time, and everybody ignores them because they're going off all the time? Those are called false positives. Well, we know how to fix those. We can find real patterns with our streaming data, and we know how to signal real problems, not false positives. And so there are places, I think, in the healthcare environment where we could make a huge difference. We're actually working with a Yale professor. We ran a contest at Yale um, to people to try to apply our technology, and the winner of the contest is a... Uh, a, a doctor and teacher and researcher at, at Yale, and he is uh, he's into uh, pulmonary medicine, and he's trying to use Apple Watch data to be able to detect early problems with his pulmonary patients and um, finding anomalies in what they're doing based on you know the streaming data out of the Apple Watch. So I think that's very promising. So I think we, there's areas where we're going to be able to add value, but we're not we're not replicating emotions. We're not replicating caring. We're not replicating hunger or thirst or any of those things. We are about finding patterns in the world and understanding them. So we're kind of at a different layer. Okay, last question from Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Love. I recently joined the board of a quantum computing company that was started by two Yale professors. So your talk about being at the frontier of computing is really resonating with me. I would love to hear you say more about how you think about building an ecosystem around Numenta and kind of, you know, both from the supplier side but also, you know, developers and how you're going to make sure that that is the paradigm that goes forward and kind of how that's changed over time. You mentioned open source and the competitions, but love to hear thoughts on that. I just have loved working with developer communities. It's been one of the greatest joys of my career. In each case, we had developer communities. At Apple, we had people writing software. At Palm, we had people writing software. I know everybody thinks Apple invented apps, but actually, we had them back in the Palm days. Um, Handspring, you know, enormous number of apps on the trio, and, uh, and we do plan to do the same at Numenta. The thing about having a platform in a developer community that's so rewarding is that they think of things you never would have thought of. I mean, just 
the number of applications that clever people come up with in the world is such a thrill. I remember the Palm Pilot, we had a guy in Africa who was doing tracking of wild animals on this thing. And it was just like, wow, whoever would have thought of that? That is so cool. So, you know, it, it's really fun to see what people do with your technology. <clears throat> now, at Numenta, we made this decision to be open source, which is is a little bit... Uh, unusual in terms of how far we went on that. I mean, we just said we're doing our research in the open. You can go into our research directories every day and see what we're working on. Uh, and and we, we just feel it is such fundamental technology and so important for the future of the, the world in so many different application areas. And it's so hard to get people up to speed on it. It is really hard material. You have to spend quite a bit of time getting into it to understand it. I, I just have to warn you about that. It's hard. And so we want to give people the best possible chance. And I think too many people go too extreme in the control direction. It's top secret. I got to kill you if I were to tell you. I mean, it's like, come on. You know, it, it's, it's so hard to convince people to use your stuff and to train them to use your stuff. If your idea is a little teeny idea that's really easy to do, well, yeah, you got to keep it secret because it's really easy to do. Somebody else is going to do it. But if you're working on big, hard ideas, just tell everybody you can about it because, you know, you never never know who's going to be able to help you with it. So we've taken this attitude of we're going to tell everybody we can about it. I love it. I have meetings, no NDAs, never a problem. <laughs> it's like, you know, whatever you want to know, I'll tell you about it. Um, and it's, it's liberating. Um, now, you might ask, let me just cover this off, how do, you, how do you reconcile that with being a business and having a business model? So um, that comes a little bit in the magic of the different open source licenses. So the license we picked, which is AGPL V3, is a uh, polluting license, a copyleft license. This means if you use our software under this license and you distribute it, so you put it in a product, you have to also distribute it under the AGPL. This is kind of toxic to a lot of companies who don't want to publish their source code. So what happens is it enables researchers, universities, uh, anybody who wants to use it to use it, yet when a commercial entity is using it, and they can start that way, they can start under the AGPL, but when they're ready to put it in a product, they come to us for a commercial license. And we essentially let them take a license outside of the AGPL where they don't have to follow the AGPL. So it's called a dual license strategy. It was pioneered by other people, not us. But when we did this research, we came upon this dual license strategy as kind of the best of both worlds, which is that we're totally open. Everybody gets to see everything we're doing on. We can try to get a community built around our technology, which we do have a growing community built around our technology, and at the same time still have a, a commercial licensing opportunity. So um, I've been really pleased with that strategy.